morning, everyone, and thank you, Chairperson. And uh, at the very outset, I'll like to thank uh, Arjuna, ma'am, and Dr. Rajnikant for having me here for this meeting. I'll be speaking on MR elastography of liver technique, interpretation, and uh, applications. As very rightly said by the uh, chairperson, we are definitely, it's a new modality for us too. And, uh, uh, but we are very fortunate that, um, you know, as an institute, we always get the uh, latest advancements and are able to, uh, you know, kind of uh, do an analysis of their utility at our place. So uh, chronic liver disease is characterized by replacement of normal hepatic tissue with diffuse fibrosis. Fibrosis is defined as an abnormal increase in collagen deposition and other components of extracellular matrix in response to chronic injury. <clears throat> Different histological stages of progressive liver fibrosis have been described from no fibrosis to cirrhotic stage. And previously, the only method of staging the degree of fibrosis was uh, liver biopsy. Uh, is it is liver biopsy an adequate reference standard? Well, there could be a debate on that because you need to have a two centimeter long core with a 16 gauge needle. You need uh, ideally 11 portal tracts. It's an invasive technique, uh, the high complication rate. Uh, there's significant uh, variability inter and intra observer. And what you are sampling is only a part of the liver volume, uh, which may result in a sampling error. The serum biomarkers are expensive and have low accuracy and reliability. Elastography, yes, ultrasound, uh, strain and shear wave uh, has been uh, uh, around for a long time now. And MR uh, elastography is the uh, new kid on the block and uh, we need to evaluate whether it is can be used uh, for all practical purposes or no. So elastography is an imaging technique used to evaluate the mechanical properties of tissues according to the propagation of the mechanical waves. Ultrasound or MRI may be coupled with a device that generates shear wave within the tissue. And the shear wave velocity is measured, which is directly related to the stiffness of the tissue. Uh, the propagation of these shear waves is faster and stiff for hard tissues and is slower in the soft tissues. So in strain elastography, it's a direct compression of the tissue and we, according to the deformity of the tissue, we infer the uh, stiffness of the tissue. On the other hand, with shear wave elastography, we send in shear waves and uh, to push in the waves and depending on the changes in velocity and the different ways of evaluation, we come to the conclusion whether the uh, tissue is stiff or not. Uh, ultrasound is the most widely used cross-sectional imaging modality. It's an integral part of diagnostic imaging. It's readily accessible, relatively inexpensive, without any known adverse bioeffects. Then why need another modality? Because there are still gaps. It is operator dependent. There's difficult uh, scanning in obese patients and in the presence of air. So uh, MR elastography mooted as the most accurate non-invasive imaging modality for the identification and staging of liver fibrosis. Compared to any ultrasound LSM technique, uh, larger portions of liver are being sampled with this modality. Combined with diagnostic MR, it is providing the most comprehensive liver imaging examination. But we need to remember is that we should not try to kind of uh, extrapolate the LSM values that we get with the ultrasound shear wave elastography and match them with the MR elastography because the ways of coming to the LSM scores are different in the two modalities. One is based on the young modulus and the other is based on the shear modulus. So how do we go about doing MR elastography? Uh, the technique involves using an active pneumatic mechanical wave driver, which is located outside the MR elastography room, as shown in that cartoon on the right side. And uh, it is connected by a flexible polyvinyl chloride tube to a passive driver through a waveguide in the wall of the room. And the passive driver is fastened onto the abdominal wall over the liver. So this just shows you the above two images on the left are the active drivers and uh, Resoundant is the uh, actually the only kind of uh, company which is uh, at present, I'm aware of the, uh, this one only, which is coming out with this, uh, the hardware for the MRE. And uh, then uh, there is that, uh, and the uh, bottom left is the uh, passive driver that is that oval shaped structure that is placed on the uh, patient's abdomen. 
So uh, where do we place the passive driver? We place it on the uh, right lobe of the liver. And uh, to ensure that we are doing it rightly, we use uh, some anatomical landmarks and that's the ziphoid process. So it is uh, used for the superior inferior positioning. And the other coordinate is by the mid clavicular line and that is used for the right left positioning of the passive driver. So uh, in patients who undergo on surgery or for some other reason, uh, this may not be the uh, representing the bulk of the liver tissue. So you could also place it in patients with hepatectomy, you could also place it on the right lateral abdominal wall. Uh, the passive driver is held in place by an elastic strap under a uh, torso phased uh, array coil. And uh, you need to set the frequency and the amplitude of this driver. So these are because this is actually going to give you the final results, what you send in that is dependent on how you send in and the what you send in. So uh, the frequency for clinical all clinical purposes is kind of fixed at 60 hertz. And uh, when we uh, actually acquire these MRE, the when it springs up on the console, you are actually the frequency is fixed that is prefixed by the engineer. So if it is set at a value, it remains at that. We only have the, uh, uh, you know, we can change only the amplitude. And this is set usually at 50% for an average size patient. It is set at 75% for uh, obese patients and at 25% for thin patients. We can use the BMI to regulate the amplitude. So if it is less than 19, you use 30% amplitude. And if it is more than 29, you use 70%. Uh, amplitude. So low amplitude may result in low quality elastograms and the high amplitude may make the patient uncomfortable because of the vibrations. So uh, a phase contrast pulse sequence with motion encoding gradients is synchronized to the frequency of the mechanical waves created by the passive driver. So you can use a 2D gradient recalled eco MR sequence typically with a 1.5 Tesla or a 2D spin eco eco planar imaging sequence. This is used to image the micron level cyclic displacement caused by the propagating shear waves to create a magnitude wave and a phase, a phase image. So this is what you get. Initially, you get a magnitude image and a phase image. So magnitude image is an anatomical image. It is telling you at each acquired section level what all tissues are there. So that will help you planning the ROI because as I uh, go further, that will uh, we'll talk about the ROI planning. And then the phase image that provides the wave motion information. So this is the raw data. Once you have the raw data, the, uh, the, the machine itself, you have the software there, which uses an inversion algorithm, processes the raw data to create maps and images. So the image that you're seeing in the top right, that is the color wave image. And it shows the propagation of the shear waves. That's an important image because when you analyze this, you will be able to progress further. So I'll come to that when we talk about the interpretation. So then you also have the bottom two images are the grayscale elastogram and the color elastogram. So the color elastogram, here you are seeing that the bulk of the liver is coded red. And if you see that bottom bar, the color elastogram has a stiffness range of 0 to 8 kilopascals. So towards the left, it is violet. And as you move towards the right, the color code increases towards yellow and finally red. So the grayscale and color elastograms with and without the superimposed 95% confidence maps. So that is another very important asset that you have to determine whether you've got your acquisition right. So it is a checkerboard on the stiffness map to exclude regions in the liver that are less reliable, noisy, and discontinuous stiffness data. So if you have a checkerboard, as you see on the image on the right, you want to plan your ROIs. You see the checkerboard, very fine checkerboard. You have to plan your ROI and exclude those checkerboard things to have a higher confidence uh, when planning your ROIs. So what is the patient preparation you need? You For chronic liver disease patients, that's mostly the patients that will be imaging for the liver. You have to have a, a fasting uh, patient status of four to six hours. You need to train your patients to hold breath because ideally uh, it should be performed at end expiration. Then the reason for it is that 
in the z-axis moment you want that the same acquisition four acquisitions at that same level you do not want to acquire at the level of the dome of the liver you do not want to acquire at the bottom of the liver and when it is end expiration there is no compression or pressure coming from the diaphragm as well so that's another reason why we recommend that mri should ideally be performed at end expiration so once you've done that you have have your the passive driver in position you four elastograms are obtained and usually we avoid the liver dome and the reason is it yields falsely high liver stiffness volume due to the obliquity of the waves we avoid the inferior portion of the liver it results in chaotic waves which yield inaccurate or non diagnostic liver stiffness values and at present we have access to only 2d mri and 3d mri is an evolution and once there it will be very useful because then it will be sensitized to detect motion in all three planes and can correct for the obliquity of waves and the failure rate of an mre acquisition will be less and if scientists are also looking at doing a free breathing acquisition using this 3d mre so uh, when in the course of acquisition of mri where do we put our mre sequence so is it affected by contrast actually no it is not affected by the iv gadolinium based contrast injection though there is some authors say that if they do the acquisition after the iv contrast agent they may get better mre values they the reason they give is that the signal intensity of the liver increases how it affects the mre acquisition uh, that's not very clearly pointed out so at present you can bring in your mre acquisition at any point in the timeline of your entire mri evaluation of the liver so as far as the uh, other protocols are concerned we have different protocols for 1.5 tesla and 3 tesla for 1.5 tesla you are using a gradient echo and for a 3 tesla you preferably use a spin echo sequence and then the acquisition time goes down only about 13 to 16 seconds when you are using a 3 tesla on the other hand it is near a minute when you use a 1.5 tesla and then you get only four slices with a 1.5 tesla with a 3 tesla you can go up to nine images and uh, rest of the things are nearly similar the uh, the settings are different but that is the end result is uh, nearly similar so once you get this acquisition how to interpret the mre so you have to look at the color wave map that's very important so you have to exclude areas of poor wave propagation low amplitude waves or wave distortion so the wave at the top is a better amplitude wave than the wave at the bottom and the reason is a high quality wave forms parallel to the outer surface of the liver and propagates undisturbed through the liver a low amplitude waves are darker have a poor signal to noise ratio as you can see in the image at the bottom as you go towards the center it is becoming dark not that you can't uh, read it the information that you get with this color wave map finally with the elastogram is inferior to the one you'll get at the top so wave distortion or wave interference is defined as waves that either do not move parallel through the liver or are disrupted and this may lead to an artifactually high or an artifactually low lsm value so here again is just to show you a variation so if it's a normal liver what happens is that the parenchyma of the normal liver attenuates the shear waves more than a cirrhotic liver so the waves are thinner and become darker as they move centrally and the cirrhotic livers on the other hand have thicker waves so here as you can see the checkered box is covering <coughs> most of the liver parenchyma so you just have a small region that is not covered by the 95% confidence map so a normal liver if you get this kind of acquisition this is okay to accept it and go ahead with the measurements as the roi with whatever little liver you have because it is the inherent liver parenchyma property of a normal liver that is not giving allowing you to draw a bigger roi in the entire liver volume so the cause of a low quality elastogram is a poor shear wave delivery too high or too low active driver power setting the amplitude that i talked about in case there are interfering paramagnetic materials like coils or the uh, stent the tip stent it may interfere with the elastogram quality that you get 
And then the motion artifacts, these, the breath hold is not great. Then also you can have a low quality elastogram. Uh, causes of a non-diagnostic elastogram in case there is significant iron load that you'll be able to decipher on your routine other examination uh, uh, MR that you'll be running along with the MRE. In case there's a non-functioning active driver or there's a disconnected or king tube connecting the active and passive drivers. So uh, once you have uh, you know done a kind of check that the quality of elastograms is good, you draw the freehand ROIs over the largest part of the liver. You, as I, if you remember, there are four slices. So on each of these, you are going to draw your ROIs. You avoid the outer liver margins, be within one centimeter or more within the outer liver margin, and avoid the edges of the 95% confidence map. Avoid the non-hepatic tissues, fissures, gallbladder fossa, and large blood vessels. Avoid the left lobe of liver because this is usually due to the cardiac pulsations, this has motion artifacts. And uh, once you've drawn the ROIs in kilopascals in each of these images, you have the mean LSM and the ROI in squares, uh, the, the area. And you can then go ahead and have a weighted arithmetic mean by adding up all these values at each uh, level, slice level, and then dividing them by the uh, areas, uh, total area. So the a recommended diagnostic area is like you have ROIs from all sections should contain at least 700 pixels for an examination. In some vendors, you will finally get the total of the pixels that you have marked uh, on the, uh, the uh, elastogram images. So uh, it is also important to know that there are some pseudo values that you can get when doing interpreting the MRE sequences. And these are called the hot spots, which are focal areas of elevated liver stiffness that are artifactual. One is in the uh, the box is showing you because of the uh, passive driver that is placed that will give rise to an artifactual high uh, LSM value in that region. Then there is the liver dome hot spot. Then there's random areas of wave dispersion. And then if you have a hepatic tumor or focal fibrosis, that is uh, you have to be careful when you mark your total ROI that. This is identify that focal area, and that is an isolated hotspot that you can have in the elastogram. So uh, these are the values that are given for interpreting what you get finally as a result in the MRE. So less than 2.5 kilopascals is a normal, 2.5 to 2.9 kilopascals is normal or inflammation, 2.9 to 3.5 is stage one or two fibrosis, 3.5 to 4 kilopascals is stage 2 or 3 fibrosis. 4 to 5 kilopascals is stage 3 or 4 fibrosis. And greater than 5 kilopascals is stage 4 fibrosis or cirrhosis. And these values are given forward for uh, by all the vendors because at present, mm -hmm. most of these vendors will be using the resoundant uh, active uh, driver and the same passive driver. So you can use these across all vendors, unlike the ultrasound values, which may differ from each, uh, you know, different vendor machine to machine, you may have different uh, interpretation values. So the clinical applications for elastography, staging of fibrosis with the main objective of determining the presence or absence of advanced cirrhosis, follow-up of patients of previously, previously diagnosed fibrosis, follow-up of patients on antiviral therapy, distinguish benign and malignant hepatic lesions, and useful for response assessment for uh, chemotherapy and local regional therapy. So, so this is uh, F1 fibrosis that we diagnose. And if you look at the uh, elastogram, color elastogram uh, maps, if you look at the color there, that is more towards the left side. Uh, that's the color coding is more towards the violet side. And uh, that also helps you uh, visually uh, evaluate the fibrosis. So this is a patient with F2 fibrosis. You can notice that the color is now of the elastograms is moving towards the red side. It's somewhere in the middle. And this is the F3 uh, fibrosis. This again is you're getting some shades of red within the uh, liver parenchyma. Always also look at, as I said, the, the top magnitude image and the then the, the color maps, the wave maps. Uh, that is the second image. And that shows that the shear waves are progressing well. So uh, this is the F4 fibrosis where you have shades of red coming in onto the color elastogram maps. And this was uh, the higher grade of uh, fibrosis that we detected. 
So uh, this is a patient with MAFR, 35 year old male, and you can see there is a signal drop on the in phase and out of phase images showing that is fat, there is fat, but whether there is any fibrosis or not, we ran the MRE sequence here and you see the magnitude image, the phase image, the grayscale elastogram, the, the wave maps and the color elastogram. And here there are only shades of violet or blue. So there was uh, no fibrosis. Also, we in all these patients, we are doing uh, biopsies as well as of till today, because these are all part of some ongoing studies and projects. So this is a male with the NASH-related disease. There's not much of signal drop on in-phase and out-of-phase images. And here, when we ran the MRE, you can see in these images, this is the, uh, again, the panel that you will always see finally when you do an MRE. So uh, the color elastogram is showing that there is red color also coming onto the map. And this uh, is a grade four fibrosis after calculating the ROIs on and the four slices that we have acquired. So follow-up assessment, MRE is well suited for longitudinal follow-up of patients with CLD. And as with, uh, for uh, typically for MRE and for other ways of, uh, you know, if you are acquiring it on the same machine, on the same, uh, uh, you know, with the same vendor, you have the delta changes, which are very important. So the change in the LSM on MRI, you can actually uh, look at it and a 20% change in mean LSM is a significant change. It is MRI is an independent risk factor for development of HCC in patients with uh, CLD. So several studies on that. So patient, the patients with LSM more than 4.4 kilopascals have a higher incidence of HCC occurrence than patients with LSM less than 4.4. Then other studies have shown cutoffs of 4.6 or 4.7 kilopascals values for high risk of developing HCC. Uh, MRE has also been used for predicting esophageal viruses. So LSM more than five kilopascals is, is associated with an increased risk of portal hypertension and esophageal viruses. In chronic pancreatitis, uh, hep, hep C pancreatitis, oh, sorry, hep C uh, hepatitis, Baseline LSM greater than 5.8 kilopascals at a high rate of decompensation. Similarly, for primary sclerosing cholangitis, LSM more than 6 kilopascals had a high risk of uh, decompensation. So several studies on uh, prediction, uh, utility of prediction with MRE as well. So benign versus malignant lesions. Uh, this is a study of 44 benign and malignant lesions. The cutoff value of 4.54 kilopascals can distinguish malignant and benign lesions with an accuracy of 98% as per the study. And MRE uh, was more accurate than diffusion weighted imaging and conventional MRI. So this is a retrospective study of 52 patients or response assessment of SCC to local regional therapy. Uh, 22 patients had radioembolization and 30 patients had TACE or RFA. Tumor stiffness was significantly lower in the treated versus the untreated tumors. A significant correlation between tumor stiffness and tumor enhancement and percentage of necrosis. Uh, correlation was stronger in patients uh, treated with radioembolization. Uh, this is part of another study that we are doing a, a similar study, a prospective study, where we are looking at the changes in MR elastography in uh, tumors post pre and post taste. So this is a 66 year old male with met ALD and LR5 lesion. Uh, and you can notice here the uh, non-rim enhancement and the washout in the left lobe of liver in the lesion. So uh, this is the MRE value, and you can notice uh, here that the anterior the lesion showing specks of uh, red. So this was uh, 7.8 kilopascals. Uh, biopsy is showing moderately differentiated HCC. And we did uh, CT and DSA and TACE in this patient. And uh, post-procedure, we are doing evaluation at uh, 12 weeks. And here, the, there was a kind of reduction in the size of the lesion. And uh, also, uh, this is a non-viable lesion as per the contrast uh, e, uh, dynamic CMR here. And the um, uh, MRE value here, our value is almost similar to what we did uh, pre-taste. Uh, so the stiffness here doesn't seem to have changed. So we... At present, it's a study in evolution, so I don't uh, have the even the preliminary results. So to conclude, MR elastography is currently the best non-invasive imaging available for detecting and staging hepatic fibrosis. It's a one-stop imaging technique because a lot of times 
for uh, chronic liver disease or for other liver disease, we are doing MR. So at the same time, we can do a MRE sequence and get more information. Obviously, there is a need for optimal imaging technique, high quality control of images. As I discussed, we need to ensure that the elastograms generated are of diagnostic quality and not uh, you know, low diagnostic quality or non-diagnostic. You need to have correct interpretation of the images and we need to evolve a structured reporting pattern of these elastograms uh, to make uh, the MRE actually viable and reproducible. And you should also actually have a kind of checklist for your uh, you know, radiographer who's evaluating the MREs or most of the times one of us has to be there on board with the radiographer as of now to ensure that the quality of MRE acquired is of diagnostic quality or no. Thank you very much.